And Burlington traffic, uh, Victor Papa Victor is about to depart runway 1-2 straight out in Burlington. Correction, it's runway 1. Wow, that's hilarious, eh? What am I doing? I'm departing runway 1-4. Yeah. yeah. It'll be runway 1-4 that are departing in Burlington. And uh, have a good night. <laughs> <laughs> that is hilarious, man. As soon as I start writing down numbers, I'm like... <sighs> Blowing the dust off the books and my brain getting back into IFR. Okay, so it's been a year since my last IFR lesson, and I gotta admit, I did not come prepared today. <laughs> Obviously, I was quite distracted this year with some awesomeness. If you've been following the Flight Chops channel, you'll know it's gotten pretty amazing as far as the types of opportunities that I've been getting and the experiences that I've been sharing. We're covering all things general aviation, and we're releasing a new video every second Friday. So far, IFR has been a little neglected, but we're gonna change that. This is part one of an ongoing series where I try to make the most engaging videos that I can covering my experience of IFR training. I was probably two thirds of the way through the training and I almost was ready for the written, but I can just tell that all the specifics are just mud. As with anything else that you learn, Steve, you gotta maintain some momentum. I hate to say it, but I almost don't know where to start. Yeah. As longtime viewers know, Flight Chops is all about admitting mistakes and learning from them. So it's in that spirit that I present the following information. Dennis and I went on a fantastic training flight that evening and it was successful from both a learning standpoint and a filmmaking standpoint as my two member crew got some wonderful footage. We even figured out an awesome system for capturing live video of the iPad running for flight. But when I got home and backed up my footage, I realized that none of my in-flight audio had recorded successfully. None. So I was gutted and I did not sleep well that evening. But Dennis is a great sport, a dedicated mentor and a close friend. So he rearranged his schedule and got us up flying again to shoot another IFR lesson a couple days later. This video is going to concentrate on footage from that second flight, but I will be cutting back to the first flight occasionally when needed. In the end, it's a better video for having so much awesome footage. Why don't we do this? Why don't we hop in a plane, see if you can just fly the thing there without putting us into a spiral dive. Uh, all right, check it, check one, two. Uh, check, check, check. I'm here. Okay, so I'll just do the taxi. You can, in relative comfort, just do all your setups. And... These foggles are effective, man. I can't see anything. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get you to enter a hold. That will test your abilities for situational awareness. Typically, holds are done over an approach fix, so we can always transition into an approach just to see how well you do that. And those three elements alone will tell me a lot about how much of this you've remembered and how good you are at it. Okay, and then James, whenever the iPad is sorted, if you give it back to Does me. Does anybody hear me? Yeah, yeah man. Hear you, you, you hear us? You maybe put me in the rough. No? No, but. You gotta be kidding me. So getting going here, I was still a little bit on edge. I did not want to repeat at the last flight's audio recording mess, but we got it sorted, so I was able to focus on this lesson. Ironically, we're completely matching the time of day, aren't we, from last one? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, right. here you go. How's that? Check one, two, check. Now you're good. I can hear you perfectly. Okay. It's just... the way it's supposed to work, as far as I can tell. This video has some great information, but it's definitely not for training purposes. It's kind of a compromised lesson, while I also tried to make a film about it. At 3,000 feet, the winds are 210 at 51 knots. 51? That's what it says. Wow, okay. So that's going to make holds interesting. Quite different than the other day, anyway. Yeah. Right. That will make the hold interesting because it's almost 90 degrees to the inbound course. Okay, so I'm clear to uh, YHM via vectors. I'm going to climb initially runway heading to 2000. Yeah. And I'm going to Ancaster. I'm going to maintain 3000. My clearance is void at 2015 Zulu. Sounds good. Yeah, my so it's just a fake time anyways. But. Very sure. Okay, so but I am departing VFR, so I'm going to... Yep, you have to announce on yep. the Unicom. And Burlington traffic, uh, Victor Bob Victor is about to depart runway 1-2 straight out in Burlington. Correction, it's runway 1. Wow, that's hilarious, eh? What am I doing? I'm departing runway 1-4. Yeah. yeah. It'll be runway 1-4 that are departing in Burlington. And uh, have a good day. <laughs> <laughs> that is hilarious, man. As soon as I start writing down numbers, I'm like... <sighs> Well, and it's an expectancy thing, right? We were just discussing runway 1-2, so of course yep. that's the first thing on your mind. But at least I caught my mistake, because yep. I, I knew there was not a runway 1-2 in Burlington. Expectancy can cause more serious problems for things like headings, frequencies, and altitudes, thus the need for briefings, readbacks, and self-checking. Okay, airspeed's alive, engine temperature and pressure is all green. And left 5 degrees for noise abatement. And then over 10, I just went to the clouds. Yep. Yeah, these foggles work. I can't see a damn thing. All right. 
I'm in the clouds, but I'm cool because they're just waiting to see me on radar sort of thing. Yeah, and once you are in the clouds and you've got, you know, the flying part out of the way, then you would contact Terminal 119.3. It's uh, Toronto Terminal, Victor Bob Victor off runway 14 Burlington, uh, climbing through 1,300 for 2,000. And then they'd say, Victor, Bob Victor's radar identified. Like clearance said, maintain 3,000, but that's only after I get talked to them at 2,000, right? Well, it's basically they're saying climb to 2,000 and then turn right towards the Ancaster Beacon oh, and I climb see. to 3,000. Okay, so I'm clear to do that as if I don't have communication, I'm still clear to do that. Sure, because you right. might not be able to get a word in edgewise, right? They're, right. They're already kind of, they've cleared a little path for you. They, they know what to expect. Yeah, that's why it's based on a time slot where if I'm not up at a certain time, then they can't expect that it. That path closes up again. Right. So coming at this as a mature student, that was never fun to me. The old E6B and all the paper, I mean the cap is huge, so it's very appealing to have a tablet with an app like ForeFlight. Now I know I need to learn it this way, so I'm trying to find a, a way that I can slowly phase the use of a tablet into my training and then my real world usage afterwards. Listen, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you, I love having flight on my iPad mini. It fits perfectly in between the handles of the yoke of an airplane, so it substitutes the cap the way we used to we used to position that there. Don't try and balance this thing on your knee. Like I said, at the worst possible time it's gonna fall off, you're not gonna know where it is. ForeFlight allowed me to do things a lot quicker, smoother, and the additional uh, features like being able to file and brief, it was a, a real time saver for me. Would I be good at doing it the old-fashioned way? Well, I wouldn't be fast, but I would be able to do it. I wouldn't like it, but I would be able to do it. And right. I want to make sure that you can, mm -hmm. okay? So pre-flight planning is obviously a whole new world with a tablet, and so is phasing the iPad into the cockpit workflow, which is part of the reason why I wanted to test four-flight synthetic vision for the first time on a flight when I wasn't PIC. I specifically chose a day that was perfect VFR on paper, but I chose a time when the sun was low, so it was very blinding. We don't have mountains around here, but we do have some sneaky radio towers, and it was cool to find them with synthetic vision. We're currently working on a plan to go flying with Jason Miller and his team out in the California mountains where we can really see this stuff working within the context of very challenging terrain. It's also important to note that I don't have a Stratus 2, so currently my synthetic vision does not have pitch and roll information, but for now I'm just happy to see it adding the additional situational awareness of the synthetic terrain database. In this particular radio tower that's on top of the escarpment here, uh, even with the sun not directly in our eyes, we still had a hard time finding it, but with synthetic vision we had no problem locating it. Uh, the one thing I have learned is that the icons in synthetic vision are scaled unlike they are on the overlay top down. Yeah. So at least visually you get this additional situation that it's taller than the chart says it is. Yeah. And later on in the evening of that first flight, Dennis showed me something really cool. He knew of a tower that had just recently been built. Uh, how high is that one off above ground, that new one? Uh, it's 800 feet. I remember the guys at Toronto Terminal warning us about it when we were flying in that area. They're made aware of that, even though they know the charts aren't updated. Right, so the chart still says 300 feet in brackets. That's the smaller antennas that are next to it. As soon as the obstacle database says there's new obstacles, that, that information goes into the form of a NOTAM, it goes into the flight supplements, it goes over to the air traffic controllers so that they all are on the same page knowing where this stuff is, but they're not going to reprint a new chart every time a new antenna is built. But that's why it's nice having a function on or flight that highlights that stuff because it's instantaneous, or at least it's as instant as the last update cycle is. So as long as you keep your obstacle database up to date, you're potentially going to have better information in synthetic vision than you do on your chart. Yep. Very cool. Okay, back to flight two and trying to do a hold with a massive wind. Yeah, this thing, we're only grounding 72 knots up here. So it really is a big wind, eh? There's some wind happening. All right, let me call Hamilton up and see if they're happy with it. Hail Tower, good afternoon. So it's the Foxtrot Victor Papa Victor with Mike. Foxtrot Victor Papa Victor, Hamilton Tower. Yeah, Victor Papa Victor, 172, last part of Burlington, 2,500 feet, about uh, 15 north uh, of you, inbound for some simulated IFR. I'd like to start with a hold of the Ancaster inbound on the local one, too. Victor Papa Victor Tower approved as requested, maintain VFR at all times, altimeter 2980. 2980, Victor Papa Victor. And the tower also came back to give us a specific squat code, which I cut out, and uh, I've also cut out some other dead air and so on. So there is definitely some missing things here, but I've done my best to maintain the essence of this lesson. Watch your assigned altitude. Thank you. I'm fixating on this and then letting that go. It's funny how that happens. 
Okay, well we have nine miles to talk about a hold entry. You can take a look at the plate. Airports, Hamilton, plates. Here you go, procedures and selected from there. Gonna take a minute to fix things because when I look down everything goes badly. He is to like split your attention briefly, right? It's time slicing. It's what's important, what needs to be done now, what Apple can be done tower, later. And a Fox truck, Mike, Mike, X-ray with information, Mike. Okay, so we're going to ILS 1-2. Yeah, how Mike, great Mike, is that? Uh, runway, you're going to win the 1 uh, three, zero, five flight. knots, what's your preference? Yeah, that's pretty ridiculous. All right, so I'm going to fly the airplane. I'm going to get this altitude fixed because I'm 100 feet over where I want to be. Okay, now, so I'm going to draw my uh, hold in here. So it's going to be on the protected side with the hockey stick there, this way, right? Sadly not. Pardon? Sadly not. Fuck. <laughs> it's the worst, man. It, well, this is what happens when you're away from it for a while. That's our wind, right? 51 from that direction? Yep. It's this way, right? Yeah, because the Bidbrook hold was a left hand. It was a non-standard hold. This is a standard hold. There we go. All right, so that makes sense now. Okay, am I still flying? Yeah. Oh, look at that, I'm actually still flying because I just was in math land for a second. I might as well have been on the ground. All right, back on board to the airplane. I have five yeah. miles to think about how the hell I'm going to enter this hole. My outbound track is going to be 297. Correct. So let's stick that somewhere. I'm not going to answer that quick. <laughs> uh, I guess I should put it here. Well, what's the inbound course on the LS? Maybe that was one one seven. So why not put that up here? And then that's on the bottom. And then it's on the bottom. Two nine seven on the bottom. Okay, so outbound track is picked. So now I do my thing, which I split the heading thing. So it's, I put my hand here, and it's like pick outbound direction. This is my favorite app for hold entries. It's the most complicated part of IFR training, from my experience, and it deserves to be its own entire topic. So I'm not going to get into hold entries specifically in this video. Now I'm not at all affiliated with that app, I just really like it. Pilot Workshops is another awesome resource and they have come on board as a sponsor recently which is really cool. The IFR Mastery Series is awesome and I also highly recommend signing up for the free tip of the week. I've been getting them for years and they're really helpful. Anyway, back to the hold. So now where's 297? It's right there. It's on the cusp. Take a look at your geo-reference map. What do you think works better? I would suggest an offset. You would, okay. I was thinking direct, but okay. The problem with so. a direct, especially with the wind coming this way, that 51 knot wind, is that if you do a direct, you're only gonna do about a half of a turn, and you're already very close. You're very close to parallel the outbound track, and the wind is gonna push you back towards it. Right. How are you gonna claw your way up wind better? Well, by an offset. Do you have to be 30 degrees? Heck no. Right. Make it a 45 degree offset if you want. Okay. So what's that heading gonna be? Well, it's gonna be 30 minus 45, or 300. Okay, so when I get there, I'm gonna make a right-hand turn, 30 degrees-ish, yeah. 255, and yeah. we are almost there. Yeah, and okay. then now do you wanna do timed hold, or do you wanna do a distance-based hold? Um, I should do time for the sake of my practice. How do I get the light on this thing? Uh, that's a good question. It appears as though that's not happening. That sucks. Yeah. Now there's timers on these radios. Oh, good God. So can I, I can't learn this. My brain is about to explode. I just had this one figured out. I can sort of see it. The camera can't see it, though. And I just flew over the beacon, didn't I? You'll know you've flown over the beacon because the beacon lays right on the, on the localizer. So as soon as the localizer... Yeah, there we go. Here, right? So I'm going to start my turn. Yep. Altar, Victor Bob Victor is entering the hold over Ancaster at 3000. Victor Bob Victor, uh, Tower Roger. Device completion of the hold requesting for. Victor Bob Victor, thanks. And I love using Cloud Ahoy to debrief flights. You can create custom flight segments so you can declutter. And I'm just going to really analyze the hold entry here in detail. So I got wind pushing my ass hard, so I should probably expect to make this turn sharper, right? Well. We'll see how it goes. I'm watching for my uh, localizer to come alive, right? Yep. And uh, I'm also looking to get onto the heading of... Uh, of 120. It's just this wind, eh? Yeah, it's monstrous here. The time that you spend halfway through the turn inbound, you've got this monster tailwind pushing you towards the lobe. You see how the lobe came alive? Yeah. And you're nowhere near 120, so I you got to crank the turn rate in. That's that tailwind. That's why I That's said a wider entry might have... Yeah. All right, so now it's gone full scale. On a flight test, you're Fail. done. Just like that, you had flight yeah. test. But yeah. now, here's your range of intercepts, right? So I would continue to the right to about 150 degree heading. Yeah, okay. Watch the altitude. 
And with any luck, you will re-intercept the localizer from this side. Before I get to the beacon. Before you get to the beacon. Mike, Mike, X-ray in the overshore zero. Now, because of this strong wind, should I consider maybe making more aggressive? Mike, Mike, X-ray, roger. No. No. What's your intentions? It's already a 30-degree cut. You're making Mike, Mike, a 40 yeah. now. Okay, here comes Mike, Mike, the low again. Mike, one, two. Now you gotta start scanning Mike, Mike, between here and here. Now you've cleared left down one. Because right. I gotta, I should be on a one, two. Well, no, I should be like into the wind, so. Right? Well, uh, whatever you do, I would do it soon. Well, I'm trying. I'm making my turn here, but not fast enough. Well, with the wind, you're right. It's, uh, so it's going to be pretty effective. Park it maybe 15, 20 degrees off. Well, well I guess I want to see if that stabilizes, if right? It stays, right. Uh, you're doing a great job. Look at now you're down to 0.7 of a mile. You're going right to the beacon. Life is good. All right, so when I get over the beacon, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reset this timer when I'm wings level a beam on the down, on the uh, outbound. Okay. But I don't need to reset that yet. I'm watching for station passage, which will get, I'll know I'll get station passage when that changes from a to or from. No, because no. this is a localizer. You're going to get station passage when this turns to zero. zero. Yeah. That just happened. Okay. So we're going to right turn and now I'm going to go to my outbound heading of, well, with wind correction. Well, sure. What was working on the inbound? About a 15 degree 15. correction. So knock 15 off to the left on the outbound. Go to 280, 285. And then start your timer. I can see the beacon out the window. It's that red light down there, James. Okay, so now since my crosswind is kind of perpendicular, it's not really going to be a question of longer or shorter. It's a minute. Uh, and if anything, what I want to do is hold more of a... What do you want for a track? 297. So, do the math, right? Go left more. Left All right. more, because the whole time we're getting squished further into the... Yeah, yeah, so I want to turn into the wind more, if anything. Exactly. So I should be... Because even now, how hard it is to get to 297. The so, wind is really picking up up here. So right now, I'm practically... My, I'm making the, the skinniest hold in the world. Yeah. Like a hot dog. I need to get out there. Like, yep. And I can cheat by looking at my iPad, because I can see that... I'm so close. Yeah. I'm just barely on the protected side here. Watch your altitude. Oh boy. So I failed my flight test twice already. Twice now, yeah. Like, if I go 200 feet over, it's a fail. Yeah. 200 and over or under, it's a fail. And if I go into the unprotected side of the hold, it's a fail. If it's full scale, yeah. Full scale, okay. And this whole time, I haven't really been scanning my engine instruments, which I should be. I could have also made my life easier by slowing down a bit into the hold, right? Instead yeah, of like in real life you would, right? Because the hold, you never know how long you're up here for, so you want to do it efficiently, and that's not at normal cruise power. And I didn't do my 5Ts because I'm just barely on board here, but when I first got there, I should have done 5Ts, and throttle would have been one of them. Yep. And I've been going for 90 seconds. So I can make my turn, Yep. and I'm going to expect this to happen fast because yep. I'm probably too close. So knowing what I know about the wind, I'm going to go more than a rate one turn. So I'll do like a 30 degree bank. Yeah, try and get it to uh, a heading of within 30 to 45 degrees of the inbound and start watching that low needle and see what it does. So my goal here is to do this before it flies across on me. Right. And if I start to get closer to my 120 before it moves, then I shallow out my turn. Yep. And look at the ground speed of the turn. 150 knots, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's breezy up here. Yeah, so this localizer is about to go on me, and... Well, you know what, I'm telling you, I'm thinking you're doing an awesome job right here, because look at that. Here it comes, wow, look how fast. Needle, how quickly it's coming in. Think of the heading you were at last time that worked. It was about a 140 heading, right? Yeah, but I'm blowing through it. Well, it's not full scale yet. It's not going full scale, come on, girl. Oh, it's close. So, right about there, level out. Well, now now I need to go a little more than 140 simply because I gotta get it back. Patience, Skywalker, it'll happen. But, but I did it because yep. it didn't go full scale on me. Yep. Okay, so that's cool. So I'm gonna hold everything. Now I gotta get back there because here now it comes. Look at the drive. And I want that to be one, two, well, one, 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 seven. One, seven, but only when this is centered. Centered. So, so, one, one, seven is 13 less. Now it's centered. Turn left 13 degrees. Oh, good God. It'll all come back. No, it's coming. I'm actually not as off board as I thought. It's just that everything, uh, I was chasing that. That was my mistake. Now yeah, I've gone past these it. These numbers generate too, too slow. slowly. So, now that we're not busy, this would have been a good time to brief the plane. Yeah, we'll do it on the next one. I'll do one more orbit and then do a briefing. Okay. And then we'll shoot the approach. Yeah. In part two, we'll finish the hold, brief the approach plate, and I'll attempt to shoot an ILS approach. 
and uh, obviously I'm a little rusty so it's a little comedic. Anyway, thanks so much for sticking around. Uh, let me know in the comments if you thought this one was too long. I really tried to get it down, but it's just hard with this type of content. Anyway, big challenge to make IFR not boring. Hopefully I succeeded. And a huge thanks to ForeFlight and all the supporters on Patreon. And keep your flight chop sharp. I'm flying like a fighter pilot on instruments. This is what you call chasing. Yes. Let's not do that. <laughs>